Nice to see everybody tonight. We'll get started in maybe just a minute or so. So just double check, make sure you have what you need to be able to sit comfortably and relatively upright, relatively still way for our guided meditation, which we'll begin in a moment. And as I often mention, it's a nice time, this first minute or so, just to look around on the Zoom screen. And we use our sense of community. You know, we have to use this visual experience. We're not smelling each other. We're not hearing each other so much. But yeah, we are in community, believe it or not, spread around much wider space than when we gather in the room at Common Ground in Minneapolis. And it's truly a beautiful thing for a group of human beings to have the great fortune, you know, time and interest and the capacity to come together like this because we're interested in having a more honest, direct, immediate, kind and wise connection with the nature of our mind, the nature of our heart, nature of our experience, so that we can live in a wiser way, in a more compassionate way. It's a gift to ourselves, it's a gift to everyone. So I'll go ahead and paste, um, just in case there are a few of you who are uh, unfamiliar, we've been chanting the three refuges, which I've just pasted. And uh, also there you'll see the uh, information about um, offering a donation if you'd like. And um, we've gotten something from Nancy, which I'll send out in next week's uh, email. But if anybody else who's been around for a while and understands how Common Ground for these 28 years now, since 1993, we've operated offering everything freely. And if you found your own way of relating to that and just your own reflections on generosity and you wanna share something, feel free to write it and uh, I'll link to it in next week's email and you can just send it to me. And it's just nice to have people sharing from their own experience. like. It's, it's sort of, you know, in some ways it's easier when somebody says, oh yeah, it costs this much. But uh, at Common Ground, we're really interested in having a relationship with everyone. And uh, part of what it means to be in relationship is like learning how to show up and learning how to feel what we feel when we show up. And are we taking advantage or are we feeling guilty and giving too much because, you know, the last thing we want is to be on the downside where we haven't given enough. So we overcompensate and even in a way that's inappropriate given our other duties and responsibilities in our lives. So, you know, we all have our own particular set of neurotic tendencies around money and around generosity and stinginess. And this particular relationship you have with Common Ground and the teacher and the community here, you know, it's, there's no right or wrong way, except this invitation, you know, for all of us to do our best to have a relationship with integrity. So that whenever we think about our relationship to this class, to each other, to the teacher, it leaves a good taste in our mouth. We don't have remorse. It feels good, but it doesn't mean you have to give a gift of money right? Because for some people, that's just not going to make sense, given what's going on. You may be deeply in debt or out of work or have to raise a bunch of kids and send them to college. So there's any number of reasons why giving money may not make sense. But that doesn't mean you, you're out of the loop of generosity. You just have to find another way, you know, like really having a lot of good wishes and appreciation. That's, that's a way to participate in the circle of giving and receiving. And, you know, we give in other places. We may, that circle doesn't have to involve common ground directly. So we all have to figure it out for ourselves. And we have our sensitive heart that will give us feedback. If we 
are interested enough in listening. So that's my little take, but it may be nice to hear from some other people. And I'll send out Nancy's reflection next week and anybody else who wants to send me your reflection, go ahead and I'll, I'll link all those in the next week's email. But let's go ahead and do our opening chant, the three refuges. Udang Saranang Gachami Gamang Saranang Gachami Sandang Saranang Kachami Dutyampi Budang Saranang Kachami Dutyampi Damang Saranang Kachami Dutyampi Sangang Saranang Kachami Tatyampi Udang Saranang Kachami Tatyampi Damang Saranang Kachami Tatyampi Sangang Saranang Gachami And we settle in <clears throat> a sense of coming home to the body the sense of belonging here in the experience of the body. Mindfulness immersed in the body. And allowing a sense of stillness to arise, not a forced sense, but a stillness that comes from feeling settled and a willingness to let these sensations here that are coming and going, let them be good enough, safe enough to be relatively still and settled. And it feels good to be immersed, mindfulness immersed in the body. Making peace with the way it is. And in a relaxed way, we'll review our meditation from last week using the really simple anatomical parts. So we begin at the head and just sensing and understanding there is skin here around the head, including the hair, 
of the head and the skin of the face, back of the head, sides, the skin around the ears, just resting in that simple truth. There is skin here, both the idea and any felt sense of skin here at the head. The awareness to the neck and the throat, and again, just simply understanding their skin here, skin of the neck. And one shoulder, sensing, understanding skin, and that one arm, upper arm, Bend of the elbow, lower arm, back of the hand, palms and fingers, skin, just skin here. The truth of skin in the arm, the hand, the shoulder, and then the other shoulder, top of the shoulder, sensing the skin and down the other arm, upper arm, skin, bend of the elbow, sensing, understanding the skin of the forearm and the back of the wrist, back of the hand, the palm, skin of the fingers, fingertips, nails of both hands, lots of skin in the arms and the upper part of the torso, upper half. Sensing the skin here, the clothes probably making contact with the skin. Stretching over the torso down to the bottom half of the torso that sense of skin along the back, along the abdomen, sides, skin, the simple truth of skin. We're neither attracted to the skin, but nor do we need to be repulsed by it. It's just skin. And then choose one of the hips, Notice the skin here along the buttocks, along that particular thigh, the bend of the knee, around the calves and shins, just skin, through the ankle down to the calloused heel, the skin along the tops of the feet and the more callous skin along the bottoms of the feet and around the toes and the nails of that foot, lots of skin. And then bringing the attention to the other hip, sensitive, aware of the skin, skin of the thigh, around the knee, around the calves and shins. And the skin of this ankle, down to the heel, sides and tops of the feet, skin along the bottoms of the feet, skin around the toes, heel, sense the toenails, lots of skin here too whole body wrapped in skin. So just keeping that in mind for a few seconds, the very simple, ordinary truth of skin, neither attracted nor repulsed by this simple truth, there is skin, skin of the body. And letting that sink in, that truth, there is skin. an attachment to the skin. 
And then we sense starting at the bottoms of the feet where we left off, the very simple and ordinary truth of flesh, the fleshy parts, the juicy parts. So we're using both the idea and our imagination and any <clears throat> felt sense of the meaty fleshy parts in the feet, pads of the toes, up through the calves, the muscle, the fleshy parts here, through the joints of the knee, any fleshy parts, the large muscles of the thighs, fleshy parts, both hips, <clears throat> pelvis, the big muscles in the buttocks, <clears throat> and all the fleshy parts here as we sense the lower half of the torso all the fleshy organs many of them related to the digestion here in the lower half of the abdomen muscles of course and diaphragm and all the fleshy parts in the upper half of the torso just sensing, imagining, understanding, yeah, flesh, lots of flesh here throughout the torso. Flesh there in the top of the shoulders, do both shoulders together. Down both arms, the muscles of the biceps, fleshy parts of the arms, the forearms, through the palms and fingers, the little muscles here, flesh, simple truth of flesh. And in the throat and throughout the neck, lots of flesh under the skin, around the bones, flesh, and up into the head, the brain, the tongue, the eyeballs, lots of flesh here in the head. And just sensing those juicy, fleshy parts here in the head. Neither attractive nor repulsive, it's just flesh. And taking a few moments as we just sense the flesh throughout the whole body. And see if it's possible to have a balanced, equanimous way of sensing the flesh of the body. This very basic truth, there is flesh, always has been flesh, just flesh. And we'll go down through the body again, just aware of the bones. So feeling the head where we left off, but now interested again, both in the idea of bones, the imagination of bones and the felt sense. Just the certainty that here in the head, there are bones, bones of the jaw, the teeth, bones of the skull, cartilage of the nose, bones. Feeling the vertebra and the neck and the structure of the collarbones and upper ribs there and the shoulders. Shoulder joints down both arms, bones of the arms, elbow, forearms, all the bones in the hands, bones, bones of the arms and hands, bones of the shoulders, and bones in the upper half of the torso. So the structure of the rib cage, of course, breastbone, spine, upper spine, down into the lower half, 
the spine of the lower half and the structure of the pelvis, arch bones here in the pelvis, sits bones, hip sockets, large bones down through the thighs, structure of the knees, shins, lower legs, all the way down to the bones right there at the heel, both heels, structure of both feet, all the little bones throughout the feet. And again, just taking a few moments as we just sense the whole body and the simple truth of bones, lots of bones, neither attractive nor repulsive, just the ordinary truth. There are bones here. There's skin, there's flesh, there's bones. This body, simple truth. And now we'll go back down to the body and we'll work with the four elements. So we'll take a little bit more time. This may be new for some of you. When the Buddha taught this meditation on the four elements, he's really helping us go beyond the use or need of concept to a more direct experiencing of what we sometimes, sometimes call the specific characteristic of sensation. So let's begin at the head again. We're just curious about the earth, earthy qualities here in the head as they actually are. So we're, <coughs> excuse me. Directly experiencing the sensations here in the head. And in particular, interested <clears throat> in solidity. What the Buddha means by the earth or earthy qualities, hardness, roughness, heaviness, and the opposites softness, smoothness, lightness. So for example, your teeth, <clears throat> upper teeth, lower teeth may be touching. And this is often for folks a very obvious experience of hardness, feeling two teeth making contact. But hardness or earthy elements can be found everywhere throughout the head. Any experience of touch will have an obvious or subtle quality of earthiness. Same as you move the awareness into the neck. We're just taking a few moments and in particular, Noticing the truth of earthiness, hardness, softness, heavy or lightness, the smoothness of the clothes or the roughness of the clothes. And down into both shoulders, just scanning the actual sensations as they <clears throat> come and go, and interested in the earthiness of these sensations here in the shoulders. And the sense of solidity from the shoulder joints down both arms, earthiness in the arms, elbows, forearms, back of the hands, palms and fingers. Earth, heaviness, lightness, 
hardness, softness here in the arms. And even smoothness or roughness. This is earth, the particular specific qualities that are referred to as earth elements. And we allow the awareness to rest here in the upper torso, interested in the solidity, the earthiness here for a while. Take your time. You don't have to look hard, just allow the different elements of the experience, the different specific sensations, just let them appear. You'll notice hardness or softness, smoothness, roughness, heaviness or lightness. down into the lower half of the torso, take your time. Whatever appears as solid or earthy, hard or soft, heavier light, down into the pelvis, both hips, floor of the pelvis, And one leg at a time, so just choose one and just feel the, from the hip sockets down through the thigh, the earthy solidity qualities here in the thigh, in the knee, shin and calf, ankle and heel, and the entirety of the foot and toes here and this one leg, we're just feeling the earthy solid qualities, hard or soft, heavy light. And from the other hip <clears throat> down the other leg, take your time, just tuning into the earth solidity. through the leg, down through the foot, to the toes. <clears throat> Aware the earthiness here directly, immediately, as sensation. <clears throat> and we'll take a time, take a little time, feel the whole body just highlighting, choosing to be sensitive to the earthy, qualities of solidity, feeling weight, for example, any roughness, any smoothness, any hardness or softness, heaviness, lightness, smoothness, roughness. This is earth. It's just how it is. It's not really personal, like any experience of hardness or heaviness, like the hand resting on the leg or lap, you could just notice the heaviness of that hand or the hardness of the touch. But those specific qualities of sensation, it's not really personal, the hardness. It's just what it is, hardness being known. And we're going to bring our awareness to another element. It's called the water element, but just pointing this term water element is just pointing to, in this case, a more subtle experience that we find in sensation itself. It's often described as that sensed experience of cohesion. and flow, the body held together. So as we bring the attention to the feet and to the legs, 
just the sense of the cohesion of the feet and legs, the sensations in a sense held together, or maybe a sense of flow movement. And in the pelvis, sense of cohesion, body held, belongs together throughout the torso, the cohesion of the shoulders and both arms, both hands. Through the neck, through the head. The water element, the cohesive element holds everything, integrates everything. So notice that more subtle aspect of the bodily experience now. And just do the best you can. We're not trying to force anything or make something up, but right here in the experience of sensation is this water element, the sense of cohesion and flow. This integration, sensing it, just the water element. And then we'll do the fire element, which is really the word used to point to the experience of temperature, warmth and coolness. So we'll begin at the head now, just feel the head as it is but train the attention to be interested in the experience of temperature, fire. So any sense of warmth or coolness. And we can always find if we're interested and we know how to pay attention, we can notice the relative warmth in places, the relative coolness. So we're learning to highlight to attune to the experience of temperature in the head to begin with. It's easy <clears throat> generally to feel a sense of coolness as the air comes in through the nostrils and a relative sense of heat as the air leaves out through the nostrils. So there are many ways to attune to fire, heat, and coolness. So take our time, we open to the throat and the neck, temperature. And tops of the shoulders, tuning to fire, to temperature. And feeling the heat and coolness down both arms, both hands. Really learn to be interested in these specific elements. So now we're working with temperature. And see if you can attune to both ends, both the coolness, but also the heat. As you feel both hands, fingers, both arms and shoulders, temperature. And we feel the upper half of the torso, taking our time, we're not forcing or rushing. And just curious about temperature here in the upper half of the torso. Interested in the fire element, down to the lower half, just patiently opening, sensing what's here. Again, we're not making anything up. We're just learning to be with the specific qualities or specific elements, heat and coolness in the lower half of the torso.
down both legs at the same time, noticing the coolness, noticing places of warmth, relatively speaking. The knees and shins, calves, and eventually down through both feet to the toes. Interested in temperature here. Letting everything else about sensation fall into the background and let the experience of temperature throughout the body come into the foreground because the mind is interested. Temperature. This is the fire element. It's not personal, is it? It's just temperature being known, coolness and warmth being felt. Not really my heat or my coolness. Nothing that I own. It's just temperature being known. And the fourth element is the wind or the air element. And it really refers to the experience, the sensory experience of pressure pushing and its opposite, which would be a sense of being held in place. So we're beginning at the head again. As we feel the head, you might feel some pressure pushing in the middle of the head maybe related to the breath coming in and going out. So just be curious, don't jump on any particular sensation, but just let the wind element, air element, let it reveal itself as a kind of pushing or pressure or stillness or being held Move down when you're ready through the neck. Through the shoulders, tops of the shoulders and shoulder joints. Any sense of stillness, any sense of pressure. Might be really subtle down both arms and hands. Take your time. Notice any inner sense of pressure, stillness, movement, flow through the hands, arms, shoulders. And take inner time feeling the upper half of the torso, interested in the air element. lower half of the torso, any sense of pressure, stillness, structure. Down both legs, both feet. Whole body, aware of the air element letting everything else fall into the background and just curious about this more subtle or at least often subtle experience of pressure, structure, even the uprightness of the body is related to the air element the body being held upright. Ah, this is what the Buddha means by the air element, the specific aspect of sensation.
And as we sense the whole body, we understand there are these elements, these aspects, aspects of sensation. None of them are personal. None of them are owned or controlled. There are natural elements that come and go because of so many causes and conditions. So we can be aware for the last few minutes just of the whole body coming and going. This constantly changing expression of sensation. And just meeting it with a beautiful, peaceful balance, balanced awareness, openness. So that was a a little bit of a longer set. Feel free to take a moment to stretch out whatever you need to do. So nice to be with everybody tonight. I really appreciate people's commitment. Part of even though the Buddhist studies class has grown over the years, of course, we started, I think, in 19, either 1998 or 1999, these uh, Buddhist studies classes. And, uh, you know, it's the idea is that we feel a sense of commitment to doing the study as best we can. You know, some of you have more time and are doing some reading to support your practice and some of you have less time, but that we're all sort of committed. And I, I keep mentioning, you know, part of that commitment, unless you have a really good reason, stay for the small groups tonight. You know, we, every other week we do small groups. Michelle is here tonight to help with the small groups. So I'll end at you know, somewhere around 8.40 uh, Minnesota time. And that will leave 20 minutes for groups of three to just talk about what your experience is. And part of the reason for the small groups is that we're more likely during the week to reflect on some of these teachings, knowing that we're gonna be in a small group. I know it can make us a little anxious, but you know how that is. It really sort of works when we're in community, when we're responsible, to each other, for each other, then we tend to be willing to say something. Even if what we have to say is like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. That's okay, right? We can be very real. We don't have to pretend, you know, or, you know, act like an expert. We just, we've got a mind, we have a body. We're trying to have a more clear, wise and kind sense of that experience of being a human being and we learn so much from each other, whatever we have to say. So I wanna review, you know, these last few weeks and and now two more weeks to go, we're really uh, digging into three particular meditations. 
And Venerable Analio, this wonderful German Buddhist monk, and I keep linking in the weekly, in the email to you all, uh, three guided meditations that are available free for free from the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies website. And I sent that email out again this afternoon. So he has a guided meditation on the anatomical parts and a guided meditation on the elements. And next week we'll be doing the corpse meditation, but we'll do a modified version basically of reflecting on the truth of impermanence in the body. So we're giving, you know, I'm giving you both some of the traditional meditations, but also more contemporary interpretations of how you might do these meditations in a way that makes sense to you. But ultimately, your job is to get the general idea of what the Buddha might be pointing to and find a way to keep these reflections alive in your mind. And remember, the, these three reflections, contemplations, meditations, you could call them any of those three words. It's really about transforming how we relate to the body. It's like, it's not enough to say, okay, everybody, let's just be mindful of the body. Let's be intimate with the way the body is because we have so much programming about the body. And so these three contemplations help to deprogram our mind. So when we did the anatomical parts, and this is the short version, we went through the longer version the last few weeks, the more traditional version where there are 32 parts, but tonight in the way Venerable Analio does it, just the skin, flesh, and bones is enough to, it really is really on this conceptual level, like what we take the body to be. To be. And you know how it is that the example from the the discourse is, I don't know if I, I don't think I read this. I, I might've mentioned the butcher, but here's the short discourse. And the document that I linked to in today's email has this quote. Furthermore, just as a skilled butcher, having killed a cow, would sit at a crossroads, cutting it into pieces. The practitioner contemplates this very body, however it stands however it's disposed in terms of the property. In this body, there is the earth property, the water property, the fire property, and the wind property. So where the anatomical parts really changes the story we have, like, oh, this body is this whole thing, but now I'm really, no, no, it's skin, flesh, and bones, or it's the liver and the toenails and the eyelashes and the head of the hair and the you know, lungs, it really changes the idea we have. With the elements that we're introducing, that I'm introducing tonight, it really brings in the impersonal quality. And this, this simile from the butcher, it's like when you go, some of you, you know, I'm sure eat meat. And when you go and buy some hamburger or, you know, whatever the different cuts of beef are, you don't think cow, you think steak or ground beef, or this or that, because the uh, idea of the whole thing is just a construction. It's just different cuts of meat. So when we learn that the body always, always has been, is now, will always be just a mix of these elements of temperature, senses of cohesion and flow, senses of stillness and pressure pushing, senses of hardness and softness, the earth elements. When we really get that anytime I look with integrity at my sensory experience of body, the tactile experience, it's always this combination of these specific characteristics, what in early Buddhism were called the four elements. So don't get hung up about earth, the word earth, the word water, the word fire, the word air or wind, right? Because they're just four words that point to the array of specific sensations or specific aspects of sensation, right? And the thing is when we attune, when we've trained our attention 
the mind to attune to the level of the elemental level of sensation, what comes on very strongly is it's not personal. The sensory experience of my body is not personal. It's not really that different. Hardness to me is not different than hardness to you. Coolness and warmth to me is not specific to me, not something I own. So it's really, you know, when we contemplate the anatomical parts, we're changing, transforming, challenging really the mind's story about the body. When we contemplate the elements, we're really challenging the mind's idea that the the sensory experience of the body is me or owned by me or belongs to me because we see how impersonal the elements are. And then next week, when we start working on the contemplation of impermanence of the body, we're really getting at this more universal level that really um, directly challenges attachment, that it isn't something to cling to to hold on to because it's, you know, it's like with birth comes death to the body. And this is true, like whether you're talking about a particular sensation that arises and ceases or the life of the body that arises with birth and then ends with death. But the truth of the body is it can't be relied on because it's in a process of change. It's always been that way, but we, in the superficiality of how the mind often operates, we conveniently forget the truth of impermanence. So when we challenge the ideas, the concepts with anatomical parts and challenge the conceit that it's me, this body, bodily experience, or belongs to me or owned by me with the contemplation of the elements, and we challenge the holding on, the clinging to the body with the contemplation of impermanence that we'll do next week. So <clears throat> interestingly, you know, in order to be mindful of the body, we have to do this deprogramming. So I wanna just make that clear because it would be a very appropriate question uh, to ask, like, well, why are we spending so much time in a way, thinking about the body, like when we do the anatomical parts, some of you have wisely said, well, that's just a lot of thinking, you know, like just memorizing the 32 parts, even the three parts of skin, flesh, and bones, you know, and there's a lot of thought involved. I mean, I talked a lot during the guided meditation. <laughs> so there's a lot of thought, a lot of concept, but we're bringing in a new view right, a new bringing in this contemplation as a counterbalance or a challenge to the existing programming. To see the body as a whole is challenged by the anatomical parts meditation. To see the body sensations as personal gets really challenged when we do the elements meditation. To see the body as dependable gets challenged when we do the imper uh, impermanence of the body meditation that we'll do next week. And we're, we're not going to do the traditional, like the traditional meditation can feel a little off-putting where you imagine, and you can find this online because there's, you know, millions of Buddhists in this world. And so they take advantage of the internet, just like other groups. And you can find pictures of the body decomposing and just to bring that home. And a lot of you know, we'll react to that. Well, why are we contemplating these morbid, disgusting aspects of the body? But actually the only reason the decomposition of the body is interpreted as being morbid and disgusting is because we're attached to the body as being more than what it is, right? It's like, we're very excited when someone has a new child, you know, and we love babies and we're very disgusted with the aging, sickness, death, falling apart, truth. But they're just two sides of the same coin, which is called body. You don't get one without the other, right? So it isn't so much about, you know, Buddhism is morbid. It's Buddhism is neither optimistic nor pessimistic. It's realistic. We want to ground 
we want our view and our understanding and the way we relate to body to be in alignment with the truth of the way it is. That's all. And it's not morbid, it's realistic. So <clears throat> that I think we talked about this <clears throat> last week that we each of us have to take responsibility to use the medicine of these teachings in skillful ways. If a lot of disgust and uh, is coming up for us, <clears throat> well, we don't, we're not interested. No one is telling us to cultivate a disgust of the body. That's not what we want. If we have a lot of clinging and attachment, then we might, it might be really good medicine to do one of these three contemplations to balance that obsessive attachment, clinging to the body because it's not helping. It's a setup for betrayal, right? A lot of us feel that way as we get older, like, why me? <laughs> There's a funny story. One of my early teachers, um, Michelle McDonald Smith, <clears throat> when I was doing some of the three month retreats at IMS back in the nineties, uh, I think one of her relatives, like a, an aunt was really old and went to visit her and she was in her nineties. And I think she had gotten cancer or some uh, terrible thing that they couldn't, they weren't going to really able to do anything about. And when uh, Michelle went to visit her, her relative said to her, why me? And that's such a powerful example that somebody who's 93 years old would be surprised that the body's falling apart. That's just a little, I mean, not specific to that person. We all have this delusion that mostly we think illness and death happens and decomposition, you know, the falling apart of the body. I mean, mostly we conveniently burn the body so that we don't see bodies decomposing, you know, or we bury it or we preserve it with chemicals so that even if we dug it up years later, it would probably still be pretty much formed, right? Because we don't like the idea of things falling apart. So in a way that's palatable, in a way that the heart can handle, it's good to bring it in, in really ordinary ways. So when you see, next time you see a bird hit your picture window and it's lying there in the garden, you know, dead, then just make a point of going out every few days and taking a look at it, you know, and pretty soon, you know, it will be gone because some animal maybe got it. But if no animal gets it, you'll just see it slowly fall apart. Or if a squirrel gets hit by a car and you notice it at the side of the road and you drive down that road every so often, they just keep looking over there. Oh yeah, you don't have to study it. You don't have to do weird stuff, but you're just sort of letting the evidence of decomposition come in. Oh yeah, that's what happens. Things fall apart. Same thing with the elements. You know, when you're, you're, you're feeling like pleasure in your body, deconstruct it in terms of the elements. Is it because it's smooth or is it light that makes it pleasant? Or if you're feeling what you would call pain, unpleasant sensations, your body, deconstruct it in terms of the elements. Okay, what's the earthy part of this pain? What's the temperature? Is it hot, burning hot or icy cold? Is there a lot of pressure, a lot of heldness, uh, structure, the air element, you know? Is there a lot of flow or cohesion? What is it? Because it's like the idea that this pain is bad, this pain, it's not fair. It gets much less personal when we break it into the elements. Is it heavy or light? Is it smooth or rough? Is it hard or soft? Is it hot or cold? Is it still or moving? Is it cohesive or flowing? Oh yeah, just these impersonal elements. So that's kind of our homework these weeks is to, you know, we learn these formal contemplations that people have been doing for centuries. We really have to do them in a somewhat formal way initially until we kind of get the point to help the kind of the way the mind is programmed to help deprogram 
we talk about this at the level of view, like how my mind understands or views or perceives, right? We're deprogramming that so that the mind can understand in a less programmed way. We would say in early Buddhism, in a way that's in alignment with Dhamma or Dharma, the way it is. That's what that word <clears throat> Dharma or Dhamma means. It's the way it is. And uh, one of the things I wanted to mention tonight, you know, our consciousness is uh, really spellbound by what in Buddhism we call nama, which is name. That's the Pali word for name. And, and name in that really simple sense, like how the mind always puts a name on experience. It's this quote I've been using for years and years because Bhante Gunaratana, he's a, an American, uh, but he's uh, originally from Sri Lanka and he's been a Buddhist monk now since he was a, a boy really. And he's in his nineties or just turned 90, right around 90 and a really powerful teacher. He's come out to Minnesota a few times. And one of the seminal books in kind of our Western Buddhist, uh, early Buddhist scene is called Mindfulness in Plain English. It's really still a good book even though it was probably written 25, 30 years ago. And uh, in the, that book, here's a paragraph. Vipassana meditation, so insight meditation, the kind of practice we do, is a set of training procedures which open us gradually to this new view of reality as it truly is. Along with this new reality goes a new view of that most central aspect of reality, me, <laughs> he has in quotes. A close inspection reveals that we have done the same thing to me that we've done to all our other perceptions. We have taken a flowing vortex of thought, feeling, and sensation, and we have solidified that into a mental construct. Then we've stuck a label onto it, me. That's the naming, the nama. We put a label on it, and then our mind is spellbound, consciousness is spellbound, by the name that the mind has put. The per, you know, when we perceive something, when we recognize something, that's part of the naming process. We name it. Then we've stuck a label onto it, me. And forever after, we treat it as if it were a static and endearing entity. Like I said, with pain, you know, if we have pain in the knee, we say, oh, my knee hurts. And then we no longer notice the hardness, the softness, the roughness, the smoothness, the heaviness, the lightness, the warmth, the coolness, the different elemental nature of that changing flow of sensation there that we label as my painful knee. We view it as a thing separate from all other things. We pinch ourselves off from the rest of that process of eternal change, which is the universe. And then we grieve over how lonely we feel. We ignore our inherent connectedness to all other beings. And we decide that I have to get more for me. Then we marvel at how greedy and insensitive human beings are. And on it goes. Every evil deed, every example of heartlessness in the world stems directly from this false sense of me as distinct from all else that is out there. So this elements meditation that we did at the end of the guided meditation tonight is a direct challenge to conceit, the conceit of me, of I, me, self, right? Self-centeredness. Now you have to check it out, right? And so much of that name me that we get spellbound, consciousness gets spellbound by the concept of me is related to the solidity of the body. So when we break down the body into these changing elements, the different specific characteristics of sensation, it really challenges how the mind is programmed to relate. Like we have this uh, 
appearance of the body, which we then immediately label as me, and then we stop looking. So we're challenging that habit of getting stuck with the label, my body, my pain, my pleasure, when we were feeling pleasure in the body. And he has a, another, just a few sentences here at the end that I'll end with. Vipassana meditation is inherently experiential. It's not theoretical. In the practice of meditation, you become sensitive to the actual experience of living, to how things feel. You do not sit around developing subtle and aesthetic thoughts about living, you live. Vipassana meditation, more than anything else, is learning to live. And if you're unfamiliar with that word Vipassana, it just means insight. And so in the West, early Buddhism here in the West, we often call it insight meditation or Vipassana meditation. So people, for example, refer to Common Ground as an insight meditation center or Vipassana meditation center, and that's fine. More and more, we use the terms early Buddhism and early Buddhist meditation center, but just to differentiate it from Zen meditation or Tibetan Buddhist meditation or some of the other lineages that arose uh, later in the sort of flow of Dharma uh, through the centuries. And one of the things I put is that quote about the butcher, but then beneath that same document that I linked to in today's email is a, I think a very useful passage from one of the most well-known, most respected Burmese teachers, someone called Pa'ak Sayada. Sayada just means a monastic teacher. So his name is Pa'ak, A-U-K. And uh, he teaches four elements meditation with his students a lot. And uh, so it's just sort of his description. I studied with him and did a six week um, retreat where I just did the, the four elements meditation for those six weeks. It was very powerful. Um, and you'll get a little sense of that if you just, I think it's maybe five pages. So you might want to review that, but we're going to do it in a more simple way. And that's the guided meditation from um, Venerable Analio, this German monk that I mentioned. And we have his elements meditation there, same place where you found the anatomical parts meditation and the same place where you're going to find the meditation on the impermanence of the body, which he does in a very simple way. Uh, just working with the breath, breathing in, aware that this may be the last in breath, breathing out, certainly one breath closer to the last breath. It's just keeping that contemplation in mind as you breathe in and out. One could be the last breath, who knows? Certainly one breath closer to the last breath. As you breathe in and out, feeling your whole body, but you'll get to that We'll get to that next week, but feel free to go ahead if you're interested. So I need to stop talking so that we can break into small groups. I just want to make a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, Shelly Graff will be doing a day-long retreat at the end of the month on the 27th. I'll be doing a half-day retreat that first Saturday in March, 1 to 5 on the 6th. Consider that if you like. Uh, when Fricky and I have started a new weekly practice check-in. These are small groups where we have time to discuss practice questions. Um, I didn't get to Mary's question and, um, and somebody else sent me a question, but we'll get to both of them. They were excellent. And uh, Scott sent in a question and uh, also Carolyn. So we'll get to those questions. I'll get to those questions next week. Um, but the new practice uh, check-in is every Sunday at 4.30 uh, with a guided meditation. And then Wynn and I just respond to people's comments and questions. So join in for that. There's also one with Stacy McClendon and myself every Tuesday at 12 noon. And Shelly Graff does one every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. So you're welcome to do that. It's a good place to have your questions uh, reflected upon. So stay here if you're able to join in for the small group, strongly encouraged. If you can't find somebody to talk with and the basic conversation is around the anatomical parts and the experience with the elements and what I had to say tonight. 
but basically anything related to your practice, especially being mindful of the body would be very appropriate in the small groups. And remember they're just 15 or 20 minutes. So it doesn't take too long, great way to develop community. So if you're gonna go, see you next Monday night. If you're gonna stay, just stay and uh, Michelle will be with you in just a moment.